Hello and welcome in the first episode of our GSL chat chamber. This time Christopher and I welcomed human rights specialist and EU general court judge Inga Reine. We touched upon questions as Poland's issue with abortion laws and other interesting topics. She also explained the process behind judging as well as emphasized the importance of moot courts for students. I hope you enjoy. Welcome. This is the fourth episode of RGSL podcast, The Chat Chamber. We are very pleased to welcome here our lovely Inga Reine, who is a judge at the General Court of the European Union. And today with you are also Marta and Christopher from RGSL Law and Diplomacy program. <laughs> so, um, Hi, so Inga. perhaps and hi. Think you can uh, you can uh, have some introductory remarks. Introductory remarks. Well, I think your presentation goes well. Now you can start with questions. Okay, so first, maybe you want to start. All right. So, uh, when taking a look at uh, your career path and its development, it's very much related to the European Union and human rights questions in particular. Uh, when you started studying uh, law at Latvian University, did you have a clear image of where you would like to see yourself in the future, or it came later when you started to study masters in law? Um, it's it's a difficult question of how you define your vision of the future when you look at yourself back twenty something, very much many years, uh, but uh, no, when I decided to study law, one thing that I remember very clearly is that fundamental rights, or as you call it, human rights, um, were really the area of my interest. And I remember very well that when I wrote my exam, the entry exam for the, for the University of Latvia, we had to write a, a, an essay uh, to enter a law faculty. I don't know how it works now, but at the time you had to write an essay. And I chose to write an essay about the rights of the child. So that was a very uh, clear idea in my mind that uh, this was something that I was very much interested in. Uh, but that was back in 1995, 1990. No, 96, I already finished. Oh, God. Uh, yes, you will have to look at my CV. My memory is no longer serving me very well. But um, that was an interest. But at the time, there was um, no human rights institution in Latvia. It was just a general idea um, and very little understanding or vision about it. And uh, I really followed the developments that took place. They, there were a lot of debates. Uh, what to do and how to do and um, at some point of time I saw an advertisement that there was uh, a human rights office to be established um, and I applied and this is how I started my career because they were interested and I passed the uh, interview and that was good luck so I started working with human rights and that was really the area of interest I was really lucky so but, basically, uh, destiny, uh, destiny was on your side and you ended up where you wanted to be. Yeah, well, it was a constellation. But what I, I can tell you one thing. I remember, um, I remember a few of my course mates with whom I had very good contact at the time. And, um, well, I remember two, of, uh, two girls in particular, not because they, they were so excellent but because they were so determined maybe or maybe because i just uh, happened to hear what was their vision of their future and one of them said well i want to be a prosecutor and for me criminal law was something well it's an interesting area but i always knew that it's not for me and i always asked myself how could one know i never asked myself how could i know that i wanted to do to do human rights but i asked how could she know that she wanted to do criminal law. Well, this is a peculiarity of human nature. Um, and, you know, she ended up being a prosecutor and a very good one. She still works in the area. I met her a few months ago and she still likes her job. And there was another girl 
who said, I want to do arbitration. And at the point of time, in the beginning, well, mid-90s, beginning mid-90s, uh, how many of us knew what arbitration was? There was not even an arbitration per se in, in Latvia. And you know what? She is a known arbitrator now. She, I have just recently uh, read on her LinkedIn that she has been appointed, if I'm not mistaken, a vice chair of Georgian Arbitration uh, Tribunal. So what I am trying to say is that uh, as crazy as your dreams may sound, there is always a grain of reality in them. And, and if you pursue them, you never know, you may as well achieve. And that's great to know. Just believe in yourself. Is basically yes, it. absolutely so. Because there will be many people in your life who will tell you that you cannot do it. You have no right to do it. You have a ridiculous idea. And I think sometimes the most ridiculous scenario is the most realistic one in the end. This, this um, is very inspiring. Marta, you can I continue. Hope so. yeah. <laughs> I truly hope so. Mm, this uh, next question I'm going to ask is more related to uh, COVID-19 situation from human rights perspective. Um, there are situations when people expressing their personal views concerning this virus as well as many other things we express well because nowadays uh, new generations are basically expressing everything what they think on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube and um, but these virus uh, things they are taken more um, emotionally um, and uh, sometimes even taken out of YouTube platforms and my question is does it somehow uh, have an impact on our freedom of expression because in this context maybe some governmental organizations or governments of states feel threatened by this crisis and that people are expressing their opinions and then they somehow try to limit and control the freedom of, of expression that we have as human beings. It's um it's a delicate question. I think if I uh, if I was uh, twenty something now, I would have said that my freedom of expression has been severely limited, and I have the right to speak up my mind. If I look from the perspective maybe of my age and my experience, and I think this is this is a lot about law, but I think you also look you need to look at it from the perspective of um, social responsibility um, and you may agree or disagree but we're all in very much uncharted waters um, today and this this pandemics has has taken us uh, unprepared in many in many respects not in terms of not only in terms of medicine but first and most of all in terms of uh, society how we react because if we remember the last big pandemics that everyone compares um, today's situation with, which was what the Spanish fever or whatever it is called. Um, the, the level of society, the, the level of development of society was not the same as today. The level of communication, the extent of, of uh, social communication was nowhere near uh, what we see today. So anything that is said or done today via whatever semi-social or social uh, public platform is having an enormous effect it may have lesser effect or it may have larger effect and yes there is a freedom of expression of, involved and but we know that freedom of expression is not unlimited you may provoke you may express your opinion but it doesn't mean that you should say whatever comes into your mind and what I think now is the dilemma that many people, and I think most of the government are facing, is what is the weight of the spoken word or the written word expressed on the subject that is so sensitive on the public opinion, on the behavior of other people? And I think this is uh, more, at least to me, this is more um, a question of individual responsibility 
what do you believe to say? Because one thing is what you say um, at the dinner table, discussing with your friends and colleagues, and, and you express your opinion, and you can hear a counter opinion, and you have a discussion. When you express your view on the internet, you don't have an immediate counterpart that can reply with a counter argument. And there is a great deal of stress and, and emotional uh, distress that uh, may lead this um, whatever opinion being gravely misunderstood. And I think this is what everyone needs to understand. I prefer not to express my views, well, for many other reasons too, but I think this would be a bit unresponsible to say now, uh, what do I believe of the science? Because I'm not a scientist. What do I believe of the government policy? Because I'm not a government. And yes, the governments may be a bit panicking, but maybe for the right reason. So you need to give everyone a chance in this discussion and be careful about what you say, because it may produce a very uh, negative effect in the minds of people who are more sensible uh, or less knowledgeable of the situation or less able to process and have their own view. I think it's a very good answer to this question, because sometimes we tend to forget that because we have accepted at least the newest generations that social media is a part of our lives since we are small but we didn't see uh, we don't see the consequences it may have later on in our future maybe you know people tend to change their opinions um, and we can see it very clearly when we talk about politicians, because at one term they're in one political uh, party and later on they change their views and they change parties and and they talk something else. And um, but it stays, you know, what you said yes. four years ago, it's still there. It stays. You and cannot delete. You can delete the message from your Facebook, but you cannot delete the message from people's minds. Exactly. Exactly. And um, talking about this um, one particularly very sensitive uh, issue that we are currently facing uh, in EU, it's Poland and its abortion laws. Well, we have always known that Poland is very strict concerning abortion laws, but now the new ruling basically eliminates this opportunity at all for women. Uh, and how does it... Um, how does it how does it have an impact on uh, women's right to health because it's also a very delicate question because every country it can they have their national laws it has their constitution and they can choose um what they follow but in terms of eu and its standards how how they counter react how does situation what, what does it show about Poland and its action? How EU can answer to this? Well, I cannot speak on behalf of the EU values. That is for sure. I wouldn't dare. I think uh, there are other uh, authority that may express this view much better than myself. I can express only my humble opinion about the situation. And um, uh, I do understand the parallel with um the series um uh, what's the name of the series um oh it escapes my mind um with um um with the woman that is wearing the the hats the handmaid's tale handmaid's tale yes thank you um, words are escaping my my mind. Yes, I see the parallel because this is where ultimately uh, women ending up uh, are ending up, uh, ending up in a dead end situation. They are given no choice. Um, we may discuss, and I'm not uh, a medical doctor. I would never dare to express a view at, at what stage one can interrupt a pregnancy and um, with what condition, but. I ultimately believe in the right of uh, choice, and this choice I believe, and of course I may uh, not know the situation in full detail, but my feeling is that women have been deprived of choice. And I think in the modern society, um, one may recognize that uh, 
this is uh, a woman's body and she does have the right to decide to a certain extent. It may be a good choice or a bad choice, but this is her choice. And this is what is inconceivable to me that someone else may say you have the right to think that way and you don't have the right to live that way. And uh, for as long as we're living in an imperfect society and there are diseases, uh, heart diseases from which both um, babies are suffering and mothers are suffering mentally, for as long as there is rape where, um, where women have no choice, for as long as there is family violence, for as long as there are difficult situations, I don't think uh, women should be deprived of, um, of their rights to choose. Um, the rest you can discuss at what stage, with what conditions, etc., etc. But to me, is uh, is difficult to accept. Yes. I I had a, a, a similar like a follow up question to this. Uh, this decision was taken by the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland, right? And uh, so my question would be: Would you believe generally that the Euro in Europe there is a shared legal space some some kind of a shared vision of what the legal space should be or is it very diversified in your opinion um it is both actually i believe uh well from what i see there are certain issues where europe is quite unified in understanding but there are also issues in which uh, countries may have very diverging views given their um historical background, given their religious uh, mapping or composition, ethnic composition, um, development. There are many, many uh, different uh, criteria that um, are at, at, the, at the basis, well, at the, in the source, um, forming the, the values. I think if we all speak about um, it's another difficult subject. If we all speak about Holocaust, the common understanding is there. But at the same time, if we speak about communism, I think you would agree with me that the views are very diverging. Here in Luxembourg last year, for example, I saw an open demonstration by a communist party. It is not seen as a, an extremist party. It has the right to exist here. And as much as I uh, fully follow the, the Latvian uh, stance, because for me, it's, I come from this country and I know the history and the, the history and the impact of this party on, on uh, the uh, existential, on existential questions for Latvia. I understand that, for example, in Luxembourg or in France, this impact is not of the same, well, of the same level. So there you, it's all understood that this may be an extremist party, but the view towards their operation, towards their symbols, may not be the same. And while abortion maybe is not the best question, it is an extremely controversial question still. Uh, but I understand that given the religious background of some of the European Union countries, this issue may be more difficult than for some others if that was what was at the back of your mind when you were asking yeah i was just like more of your opinion how you see it and you answered that thank you you're welcome so if we take a look uh if, if we take a look at uh, your past experience you have worked as an advisor to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, uh, yes. and been in a mission in Kosovo and in a mission in Montenegro. So yes. I think a very, very a varied uh, European experience. This is amazing. What were your main tasks? And maybe let's start with a small introduction of what OSCE is. Because if we talk uh, about security or cooperation, the first thing that that comes to into people's minds is NATO, right? Uh, so, mm. what is OSCE, and what did you do there? 
Well, um, OSCE was um, founded, now I am, uh, may not be uh, fully prepared to answer uh, the question on fully correctly on the history of the OEC, I would have to maybe refresh my memory. But OEC was founded as a conference, uh, a security conference, um, to discuss issues. This is in the, in the aftermath of the, uh, um, of the uh, Cold War. And um, it's not a military organization. NATO is a military organization, and OEC is not a military organization. This is first and, and foremost difference. And what is also uh, what needs to be understood that NATO was found as a well, again, it's maybe not the best terminology, but since I have to answer so quickly, NATO was uh, founded as um, to counterbalance the Soviet Union with a clear perspective that Soviet Union would never become part of NATO. Maybe there were discussions, I'm not familiar with this, but the clear purpose was there. Um, this was in, in, the, in the aftermath of the, of the Second World War, and uh, its main goal was to build up the military uh, capacity of the Western Europe, as we call it, uh, together with the United States, Canada, um, to uh, to be able to withstand the threat on the continent. The OSCE was a political forum for discussion uh, with the European Union. This is what is being very important. And uh, yes, this was a security forum to discuss various issues. Uh, and that played, I may be mistaken, but I believe OEC played an important role in uh, democratic development of, of Europe. Uh, you know, in, I would not be able maybe to speak on behalf of Germany and reunification of Germany. It was a complex political process, which I know very little of. Uh, I was little myself. I would not be competent to speak about it, but uh, if we speak about the Soviet Union um, and its disintegration and um, the uh, process of regaining of independence by the Baltic states, I believe the role of the OEC was important. I would not maybe dare to say if it was crucial or decisive, um, that would maybe be a too strong uh, terminology to use, but this was a forum to lead to a peaceful transition. It started with security issues, but at some point of time, it evolved into peace building and uh, conflict prevention. And this is what is important because NATO is not uh, per se as a conflict prevention. Then it, it is being involved in this discussion, but NATO is a military organization. OEC is a civilian organization that has, um, close dialogue with military, there are also military dimension, uh, military cooperation dimension to the OEC, but it's not the same. And uh, this is how it comes in, because um, UN, uh, as you know, it also has its military operation. Well, you don't know, but now I'm there to tell you. Uh, United Nations also have a military dimension, but uh, they were more present in Africa and Asia and in the, in, in, on the European continent, when we had conflicts, uh, when there were conflicts in Bosnia Herzegovina, when there were conflicts uh, in, in former Yugoslavia, um, to be more correctly, in on the territory of the post-Soviet Union, um, United Nations, um, for uh, reasons that I may not maybe remember fully correctly, but were not the best, and maybe also because of the um, of the history of what happened in uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, OEC took a leading role, maybe not the fully leading role, but it took a, an important role in those processes, in peace building, peace restoring, con further conflict prevention and dialogue. And this is how I ended up, because the OEC mission was working very closely with the United Nations in, um, first of all, monitoring human rights situation and uh, building independent democratic institutions. Uh, and the OEC was responsible in Kosovo specifically for establishment of the Ombudsman Office, and this is how I ended up there, because I had experience 
with the National Human Rights Institution in Latvia. Um, and then I also took part in several uh, projects, mini projects, um, in uh, Ukraine and Moldova. And uh, uh, I was approached with the question, would I be interested in uh, setting up also the Ombuds Institution in Kosovo? And once that institution was uh, set up and operational, I moved on to Montenegro to do very much the same thing. It, uh, it's interesting very also that the time when you were in the missions, right? I think it's a very politically sensitive time because it was just after the Yugoslav war, right? So so could you see the impact in, in uh, human rights? And you probably uh, did see it, but how perhaps uh, did you see the impacts on human rights knowing that it was a post-war period? Well, a bit of a historical context. The UN Security Council Resolution 1244 that established the mission and ended up the, the armed conflict was signed in, uh, was adopted in uh, June 99. I don't remember the date, but I think it was June. In terms of month, I could not have been mistaken. And um, the mission um, was set up and, well, we became fully operational almost right after it. Actually, there was an OSD mission uh, before uh, the military conflict erupted, but it was more military. There were military observers to follow up the developments on the Serbian and Kosovo side, but as soon as uh, um, member states, uh, well, NATO has agreed on, on taking part uh, in uh, um, military operation, the mission was withdrawn. And then after the Security Council adopted the resolution, the mission was set up again. It was the UN mission, a big part of the UN mission, then it was a NATO mission, and then it was an OEC mission, but that was already a peace building and um, civilian mission. OEC from that moment on was civilian mission. There were still military observers, but the main impact was uh, civilian uh, expertise. And um, well, post-conflict situation is always a difficult situation. And um, I don't know how much you want to hear about it, but it wasn't easy because you have to place yourself in a situation where um, there are extreme emotions on both sides. If you take Kosovo Albanians and Kosovo Serbs, there were also other ethnicities uh, gravely impacted. And you have also Turks living in Kosovo, the Romas living in Kosovo, all of them have suffered to different degrees, to different extent. And it wasn't easy for any of them. And of course, there were um, people, forces, groups that were trying to take advantage of it. Uh, there were Serbs that have been radicalized. There were Albanians who have been radicalized. Uh, they were going at each other, they were going all at Romas, they were going at Turks, they were going at Christians. Um, again, we're coming to the situation, maybe maybe there is a long, uh, a very distant way to compare with the uh, situation of pandemics, but uh, there is a certain parallel because people were speaking, and you know, you have political forces and politicians who want to express their views, and that was the question how those views were affecting people who have been suffering a lot before that and what kind of emotions it produced in communities it was very difficult and uh, preparation for elections uh, were extremely difficult and there were a lot of attacks also against uh, uh, albanian politicians kosovo albanian politicians who were uh, more liberal than was accepted by um, what you call maybe well, the Kosovo Liberation Army, if I may use the unspoken term. Um, I can say it's, it's difficult and it's difficult for people who were there for many colleagues uh, because you you find yourself uh, at a cro in the crossfire all the time. You cannot take sides, but you are human. You see, you see um, the suffering. You see people who are lacking education, but who are having their views. And um, 
Well, I would say for someone who wants to do international organization or international politics, this is a very useful environment to be in. You have to find a compromise. You are constantly looking for a compromise. And uh, compromises think, are not easy. I think that experience probably also has been very, very useful, for example, nowadays probably, right? This experience is always useful because you meet extraordinary people and this is a highly this is the environment where those extraordinary people are uh, in very high concentration if i may say under normal circumstances you would have to travel the world three times to meet any of them and uh, if you are lucky to get yourself in uh, such a place you, you may be suffer a little bit because there is no electricity there is no water you need to work a lot you need to survive there is no food you cannot go out to the shop to buy food you have to travel 60 70 kilometers to cross the border to buy some food huh? you have no water if you have water you have no power if you have power you have no water and you have to wash your your clothes and uh, cook some food it's a, it's a big challenge in terms of daily life um, but this what uh, what forms you, I think, as a, as a person that, that uh, also makes you learn many things. Yes, survival skills, negotiation skills, um, and some integrity, I would say. I think that this uh, last few sentences you said, I think that, well, at least me, I, I didn't think about this aspect that you also had to suffer these aspects because people tend to not pay attention. They don't think that far in terms of, well, those people who are making those decisions and solving the situation where they're in the terms, like in similar circumstances as people living there, did they also didn't have access to these things, to water, electricity. So I was just sitting wondering, oh, she had these obstacles as well. Absolutely and so, yes. When you're in the office, you have your power, but in the office you cannot cook food. So to cook food, you have to go back home and to go back home, you need to find a grocery store and the grocery store isn't there i mean in the best case you have some frozen food um that's life yeah that's life but now you're in general court of eu and um now a question more related to your nowadays position um can you say that there uh, some greatest challenges you have faced working in general court of EU, something you did not expect to have, or um, can you say that this this is your dream job and this is the place for you, and that's what you want to do? Um, well, I think I think I can say yes that it is my dream job because I wanted to be a judge for i think for as long as i study law it's um maybe again it's it's difficult to say yes i i don't know maybe someone someone maybe there is someone who says yes i want to be the president at five years of age and that is a you know a conscious decision um i wouldn't say so to me it came first as a general idea i mean if one day I would imagine the uh, the highest point of my career, what would that highest point perhaps be? Just you know, in terms of active thinking, just a, a dream. And for me, a work of the judge is um, a work, a highest point of of a legal career, but. It doesn't need to be for somebody else. It depends, I think, very much on the personality. I like balancing acts. And this is the reason for me, it is the most interesting part of the job. Uh, I can never be, I have been defending government for many years. And uh, this balancing act was uh, sometimes what I was lacking in my job, as much as I loved it. I think that was an extremely productive and challenging part of, uh, of my career where I learned uh, a great deal. But when you are defending someone, this is what sits at the back of your mind. Maybe for some people it's, it's good. They're extremely capable defense lawyers, but there is always this, um, this aspect that you have to take one side. And 
a judge has to find the way in the middle. And this is what uh, seems and still seems the most interesting part of, of legal job. And if you ask what is the greatest uh, challenge, uh, I will tell you that this is the greatest challenge of uh, a work of a judge is to find that balancing act. And um, the longer I work as a judge, the more I see how difficult it may be because one thing is to have an opinion on the issue. Another thing is to adjudicate the case because uh, um, I truly, well, it's not that I truly believe in that, but I think life is what what confirms the statement that uh, a case is won not by the party which is right, but by the party that offers the best arguments. And this is something that is extremely important for lawyers to understand, is that a judge cannot do the job of the party. A judge is limited. Yes, there, depending on the legal system, there is um, a margin that a judge may have in terms of taking initiative on some issues. But this margin is extremely narrow. It may be a bit broader for some systems. It may be close to non-existent in some others. But still, even with the margin, a judge cannot do the job of the party. And if the party does not think through the case, and does not think carefully through the arguments, a judge will not be able to um, award a decision in that party's favor. And I can tell you that even the most experienced lawyers, and we see here, I would say the most experienced lawyers that we have in Europe, and not only in Europe, we also have uh, US lawyers and Canadian lawyers that come before us, for as long as they have a license to, to practice in Europe, they fail. They fail. Uh, sometimes we ask ourselves the question, why has it been lack of time, lack of uh, understanding, lack of motivation, bad luck, maybe? Um, it's difficult to say. But this is what happens. And this is when we ask ourselves a question, like you have a case and you may have an opinion, but your opinion may not be the same as the solution of the case. And this is that balancing act that you that you have to perform, and uh, then the judgment comes out, and then the higher instance may have a different opinion. But yes, uh, the best advice uh, I have given always this advice to my colleagues uh, that practice law, and now I uh, am even stronger in my opinion that you start working your case, you start working on your court case before you take your first decision. Not when you stay when you start thinking about your court case at the moment you start writing your application to the court. This is too late. This is few years too late. So I think uh, strategic I think thinking is very important. I may I may be mistaken, of course, but as I understand, uh, you have said you have you have you have said that uh, the legal profession is quite uh, creative profession absolutely so and uh, how would you connect it to the fact that that judges in many situations do not have this uh like discretion right and that they do not that they so how do you probably see that the legal profession is a creative one well the fact that you do not have a discretion does not mean that you are not creative um how to uh, let me see uh, it is a bit of a situation that you have to cook a soup with a, you know, with an army boot. Sometimes it is so. Yes, you have to be very creative how you do it, but you can do it. Sometimes you have all the ingredients. If you have all the ingredients, the more is the pleasure. Then your creativity, I mean, the sky is the limit. But I believe that the true creativity. Uh, then comes really in the situation that you have only an army boot, a bit salt and a bit of pepper, and then you have to cook a soup. Okay, yeah, sorry, uh, technical. Uh, but yeah, what I wanted to add to this probably is that yeah, 
I would also probably agree that, that the legal profession is a creative one because in the end, uh, any lawyer or judge is operating with words, sentences, right? They have the yeah. power to formulate it in the most uh, effective way. And, and also I would say the fact that it is always about how you present this, not only uh, not only the, the thoughts themselves, but what you choose to uh, link, for example, and, and what you choose to use as examples even. Yeah, I would completely agree. I think this is an interesting thing. Yes, to, to, be, uh, to be a bit more serious about the subject. Um, yes, uh, but when we draft judgments, of course, you have arguments of the parties, but it is up to a judge to decide which argument to put in the front line, around which argument you build your solution. And this is where we do have a margin. I mean, the party may say, well, this is our main argument, and uh, they may raise a subsidiary argument that is on the 35th place, which may turn the case around for me as a judge. And this is uh, why um, I think, uh, well, my advice to students, maybe to political science it will be a bit more difficult, but to students who study law, you have to be very careful when you read the, the judgments. And I know that it's uh, sometimes extremely boring that, you know, on the 35th page you have the reference to an earlier judgment and a paragraph. But this is where the solution is hidden. Because sometimes, yes, you may say new things, but it's rare that a judgment will, would say 35 new things in one go. You may say one little thing in one comma, and you will build up to that comma to come through maybe 20, 35 pages of argumentation. And this is what is important when you read the judgment. Don't ignore the references that you find in the judgment. Because you may refer to one case or you may refer to another case, but the reference to the case at source may give you a better hint as to the thinking behind the judgment, why this principle was put in this paragraph and not in the end. Um, it takes time, it's not easy, and um, there is a big discussion on how especially the general court can simplify its judgment because sometimes we, we have long and complex judgments. Um, but there is a limit to simplification because this is where the, the jewel is hidden. How you build up the sentence and how you put your reference because you may put a quote, but you may have this little word in the brackets which say, see the judgment and when you say see the judgment it means that we're referring to the spirit but not necessarily to the exact content of the sentence and this is where the creativity starts this is something that is very often not seen and not understood not only by students and students are only learning but i would also say by academia and practicing lawyers that it's difficult to grasp because for example the european uh, court of human rights very often puts mutatis mutatis then it's much clearer as a reference that you understand that it is not a quote this is insofar as applicable we're being extreme much more succinct in what we say and this is why it may be more difficult to spot but when reading judgments, I really advise to pay attention, especially to references and to the verbs we use, because this is indeed where we show the specificity of the case and where we show that we're taking the case further than the previous jurisprudence. Martha? Yeah, well, continuing this uh, the subject, maybe what are the com most common issues uh, and uh, topics that are brought to general court about trademarks or I don't know, what are the main things that usually are brought to the court that you have to deal with? 
the major, I don't have the statistics in front of my eyes. I should have taken it. Um, I have to think. Um, well, I will speak with from the top of my head. Uh, I will not be grossly mistaken. Trademarks are, in terms of uh, in terms of numbers, trademarks are uh, the uh, well the highest, well, the most important source of our litigation. And there is a very good explanation why, um, because the European Trademark Office uh, processes so many applications per year, trademark applications, European trademark applications, then the tiny bit that is being appealed against the decisions uh, of Alicante Office that are being appealed against form uh, such a big number in, in absolute terms that it becomes an important pressure on, on the court. Um, some say trademarks are being very simple cases. Um, but I would maybe dare to disagree because first of all, these cases show an impact that our decisions or the European Union agency may have on the daily life of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. Because trademarks is something that is important for any enterprise that wants to operate uh, outside its home country. And I'm not speaking only European countries. Right? There are trademarks coming from third countries. And now we will have also to see what happens with uh, Brexit. Um, because national trademarks for those enterprises uh, who have national trademarks but who want to operate on the European market, this is the most logical decision to take, is to seek the European trademark protection. So these are the first numbers. The second numbers, I will try to see if I can open the statistics. Um, I may be, um, well, roughly, that would be, um, how we call it? We call it individual decisions. These are various types of individual decisions taken by or uh, by the European institutions against someone. Then uh, we have European Civil Service, and these are extremely interesting cases, uh, especially to compare with the uh, national uh, perspective, because this is where um, the European Union has a bit of a historical context. The uh, European Civil Service statutes date back to the 1960s. It has derived few changes, but um, far fewer changes than the national labor law or the national civil uh, service law in member states. And this is where we often ask ourselves the question, how reasonable that civil service statu uh, statutes are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, European civil servants if you compare it with the situation of member states. And this is a very interesting debate if you take it from the perspective of uh, the European values, because we say that member states have to form common European values and common European values come from the treaties. So, and the European Court of, the Court of Justice of the European Union sometimes set a standard that is higher than in some member states, and member states are obliged to then follow a higher standard. And here is the very good example that you have standards in the European law that may not be as high as respective standards in member states. What do we do? Shall we bring the European standard higher? but then we should say how the European institutions should act. This is a very interesting dilemma, and uh, I think this shows a bit of, a, again, a balancing act of, um, of the European law, that it's, it's a two-way street. It's not only, as we say, Brussels versus uh, capitals. It may be capitals, versus Brussels, that Brussels have to, has to rethink and uh, 
see how European law can be modernized. But then if we go back to the uh, statistics, we have competition cases uh, which may not be so numerical, but you don't need big numbers to show the great importance. Yes, exactly. This is really when uh, you have major interests. Uh, I don't need to name you. You know the Google, the Intel, the big, the big uh, cartel cases, um, the Facebook. I mean, it's it's a big. It's a big game, um, important interests involved. And as I said, you may have one case, but that case will occupy uh, your mind for a few years in a row because it's so complex. Then we have state aid cases. Again, uh, these are important cases because these are cases that involve uh, European market and European interests uh, versus national interests. Um, in terms of absolute numbers, they may not be so many, but in terms of complexity, yes, they're also very complex cases because, again, you need to find a balancing act of how a member state may decide to, um, I don't know if that would be the best term to use, but to, uh, yes, to give maybe an opportunity to its economy or to its uh, producers <coughs> or to certain producers and how that would then affect the common European market. And again, these are very interesting cases, very complex cases. Uh, you have the tax cases, you have taxation cases. You have a big deal, a, a big debate about the uh, um, air transportation cases. You have low-cost companies against what you call the uh, fully commercial companies not only in terms of prices, but also in terms of access to airports and, and uh, regional development. These are not easy solutions. You have harbor cases, you have um, transport cases, anything you imagine. Again, you have uh, cases of uh, anti-dumping cases, again, where the European Union is seeking to protect the European market, to, to give a, an equal opportunity of the European market vis-a-vis -vis, uh, third states and this is the area where you go very closely with the international law because you have the WTO standards and it's a difficult issue to, to discuss um, and uh, you know I think this would be yes and the the new and the very specific area that we have the two areas that I would like to mention specifically these are not this is by far not exhaustive list of cases that we have but two particular cases that maybe in um, today's situation are uh, particularly important. Uh, first is in the aftermath of the 2007-2008 crisis, these are the financial and banking cases. You have the single uh, resolution mechanism and the role of the European Central Bank and the uh, financial policy of the European Union, how uh, we supervise and control the financial markets and, and the banking supervision there are still a lot of unopened and un, uh, uncovered issues it's a very new area a very complex area of law uh, that and we have a lot of cases on this um, and it's it's in the development stage and uh, there will be a, a debate will continue and i think in the aftermath uh, given that the economy is slowing down we will be continuously involved in this and the second is what we call uh, chemical substances cases. And there are three elements to this. And this, again, is a huge uh, well, business interest and uh, society interest involved. Uh, these are uh, the chemical substances that we use for uh, farming. Then we have chemical substances, various, uh, that we use in medicine. And in food. So you have three agencies. You have the European Chemical Agency, the European Food and Safety Authority, and the European Medical Agency that take decisions that release those uh, products on the European market. Um, and this is again a very complex area where science and law are interacting. Something that we use 
in soil end up on our table, may end up on our table. It affects animals, it affects human health. Uh, the medication that we use, the vaccines that may come to the market would have to go through this procedure. And this is where you see close interaction between member states and the European Union, because the procedure starts, uh, the, the procedure involves uh, member states. There is a big role, an important role played by member states. But the final decision is taken by the European Commission. It goes through the agency and then it ends up on the table of the European Commission. These procedures are very complex, but the again, the economic interests and human health are at stake. And these are, uh, again, complex cases. Maybe in absolute numbers, they're not a lot, but in terms of impact that they have, these are very important cases that we treat. I think this proves the old saying that uh, the lawyers need to be very knowledgeable in many aspects of, uh, of not only law, but just life. And, and basically this shows that I would say this is especially true for judges, that you need to be able to read. You, uh, also something probably not very legal. You also need to, you know, consult probably with other people who know uh, specific fields, right? Yes and no. Uh, again, okay. we cannot, uh, we cannot, we, I can, we can do some reading, but you need to understand that a judge has to work on the basis of a case file. And my knowledge uh, of a science may not interfere with my legal thinking. This is a very, again, this, this is where it is very creative, but sometimes maybe very frustrating because you need to understand what is the legal issue in a very scientific debate. But this is again a pity, uh, but I hope that uh, that aspect of our work will be solved uh, in the near future, but it's a pity that our uh, court hearings are not being web streamed. This is the greatest benefit that the European Court of Human Rights has done uh, back in 2004, if I'm not mistaken, is to have uh, web streaming of all its hearings. And this is how you see really the, the nitty gritty of a case and the nitty gritty of, of the debate. Uh, you can't see it all just from the judgment because judgment is a summary of the case. And I think, I hope that uh, one day will come when the uh, hearings of the European Court of Justice and the general courts uh, will be web streamed and then you will see the the debate, the questions that come in and the answers that are given because uh, it's it's not so evident. A judgment will give you a summary which sometimes you say oh well this is very clear but it doesn't mean that that was so very clear at the beginning of the case. Well uh, taking a step back from general court you used to work as permanent representative of Latvia to the EU for some time. Legal advisor. Legal, legal advisor, okay. Um, so in this position, doesn't somehow, in some way, you're, there's a necessity of negotiation skills and uh, talking with people, and in general, working in your position as a judge, do you also need this uh, negotiation skills and background uh, of talking Absolutely with people? So. Absolutely. And so. in some in some way, how did you develop your skills? Um, did you go to the courses, or it just came naturally with experience that you talk with yes, people? Yes, I was born. Yes, I was born in genius. You know, <laughs> started talking on the second day. <laughs> uh, no, of course not. It's a, it's a hard work. Um, Yes, I believe there are courses that develop, uh, that help you develop negotiation skills. And I think for lawyers, it would be very important to, to follow them. I don't know if RGSL offer them, but I would certainly be uh, very much uh, supportive of, of that idea from, from, from the perspective of my experience. Uh, but not given by a lawyer. Um, I many, 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 many years ago, um, we had a very brief session, maybe a couple of days, um, given, if I'm not mistaken, by maybe a psychologist. But I, I was very young. I was 
still when working at the Latvian National Human Rights Office. Um, but it was a little bit about meditation. Oh, mediation, sorry. Mediation, mediation my mistake. It's not the same maybe as uh, negotiation, but it's somewhat, somewhat similar. Um, we had this training session because uh, one of the uh, one of the um, um, powers that we had in the law is to um, assist parties in uh, finding a friendly settlement. And to do a friendly settlement, you need to have a mediation session. Um, but that's all I had. Uh, I think you do by learning, and I had great uh, teachers. Um, I have had great luck with having great teachers, both diplomats and politicians, from whom I could learn. But this is something that um, I think lawyers must absolutely learn. One thing is to have an opinion, which is very important. It's, it's important for uh, anyone um, working in, in, a, in a profession that involves decision making. But to have your opinion is one thing. But if you end up in a diplomatic service, or you end up in a law firm, um, or you end up, well, let's see, I think many professions would require that, your opinion alone doesn't really count. I mean, it's important to have it, to understand what is your departure point. But to arrive at a solution, you need to combine your opinion with the opinion of other people. And if you take on a larger scale uh, to combine the opinion of your political party with another political party, or your delegation with the delegation of another member state. And this is where negotiation skills are absolutely necessary. Um, and this is, again, going back to what I said about the experience, this is where you start looking for compromises. You, you may call it the middle ground, if it's an easy solution, but it's rarely an easy solution. So why I use the term compromise, because you have to understand where you give in and where you gain. What's your pain, what's your gain? And this is, um, uh, this is not easy. This, uh, this involves a lot of work. And uh, it involves a lot of knowledge, a lot of substantial knowledge. It involves a very good knowledge of procedure, how you can achieve what you need. And um, yes, it's, um, it's a necessary skill. And uh, in uh, diplomatic service, yes, this is uh, maybe something that you need uh, dearly in particular, because this is otherwise, I mean, maybe the United States may tell the rest of the world, you know, we're the best and uh, the rest of the world follows. Uh, for a small state uh, like Latvia, it's, uh, it's a survival issue. And yes, I did it when I was in Brussels. This was part of my work. I chaired a number of working groups. And as a chair that uh, you find yourself, especially as a presidency, you find yourself in a bit of a, backseat position because you are have limited capacity in say what you think because you have to lead the group with very diverging views and find that compromise and uh, then find uh, well the compromise that uh, a majority would follow i don't know how else can i express it it's it's very delicate issue but it's extremely interesting and i think uh, as a judge, again, you need it because you are either three or five or 11 or seven, depending on where you work and how you work. You're rarely alone. If I'm alone, then I negotiate with myself and I can still have three opinions on the case. But if I have at least uh, two other judges, that's it. You may end up in a case where you have three different opinions. What do you do? You negotiate. Maybe not in the same way as you negotiate while working in a diplomatic service, but you have to find a middle, a middle ground. So you, you started to, I, I com firstly, I would say that I completely agree that there is a very delicate question always, how can Latvia represent its interests in, in international institutions? So uh, perhaps this would be a follow-up question. So uh, 
how can Latvians change the world? How can Latvians present uh, better uh, their interests in the international sphere? Perhaps what is our strength that we should use? Uh, I think our strength and uh, strengths and uh, weakness um, may be described in similar terms. Latvia is a small state. But small state does not mean uh, powerless. There is always a question of alliances. You build alliances with others. And you see where your vote would be of greatest value. But then uh, to know that, and this is, um, and this is, I think, where we still have uh, a margin to grow, but there is always a margin to grow is um, we have understood very well many procedures, many. If I look at where uh, where we started back in, well, not really started, where I started, what was the average knowledge of my colleagues uh, and discussions that I had with my colleagues back in 1995 and 1996, and the uh, sophistication that of, of our discussions that we have now in, 2020 it's the earth and the moon it's it's a huge distance in terms of understanding in terms of in terms of language knowledge it's extremely important language knowledge for anyone and i think today practicing law or practicing uh, political science economy social science uh, psychology um, I, I don't know it's difficult to imagine language knowledge is a key the more languages you speak the better you understand other people, not only in terms of what they say, but why they say things, because with language comes understanding of the culture. So it gives you the, the, the perspective of what background that person has and why that person or that delegation says something. And if you understand it better, you can offer a solution that is acceptable. And this is uh, extremely important to understand. As I say, one thing is to understand what is important for you nationally, personally, as a state, as a political party. But one thing is to understand what you have in your pocket and what you want to achieve. Another thing is to understand how to achieve it. And you may have, you may know all the procedures again, without understanding, full understanding of your adversary, or you can call it adversary or counterpart. Uh, you will not be able to achieve it because your offer must be must come in a context must be acceptable must be translatable into that other person's um, reality or language so language knowledge uh, is a huge difference between what we had then and what we have now we have very good understanding now uh, through the institutional memory gained we have good understanding of uh, procedures because procedures is something that do not change so quickly, especially if we speak about international uh, fora uh, like the United Nations, the OEC, the Council of Europe, the European Union. You may have some difference, but in large sense, the procedures would be more or less consistent. You have details that add in or are deleted, but um, this is the something that you keep as a general knowledge. Where I think we can build on right now, where I still feel a gap, is the substantial knowledge, because this is what needs time and uh, really uh, a lot of effort. You need to do research. You need to you need to have your area of expertise. You can't you cannot know it all. We are not so big as as big as Germany or the United Kingdom or France that has numerically many people who can know it all. But there are examples that we can follow. And this is, for example, what I have seen in my work, uh, for example, from the Czech delegation. They had their narrow area of specialization, um, which was very specific. But they had experts and then they could trade on that knowledge because they had strong points. And then they 
they could follow they could offer that expertise they could have a, a, a stronger position on that one not because they had of course you can sometimes have a stronger position because it's your political national political priority but it doesn't mean that that would be the same priority for everybody else and that is an important thing to understand then you are strong nationally but you are weak internationally it's difficult to trade so to counterbalance that you need to have a stronger knowledge on issue that interests everyone and this is where we have room to improve and especially in the in the keeping the perspective of the next presidency which comes i think in 2028 which is eight years this is not so long time this is now where we can build in the capacity the substantive capacity the knowledge on on some substantive complex matters where then we can uh, as a country as a state we can take a position um, and then that would create uh, an alliance around us on that point that would be maybe my vision of things and maybe you as we are closing uh, closer to the end of our interview maybe you have a question you would like to ask us or to to what we have to think of maybe some advice uh, and um, maybe something to listeners in general as well well um i have maybe a couple of questions one is uh, simpler when my one is maybe more difficult um I would like to ask uh, whether there is a discussion among the uh, students in RGSL uh, about taking part in the European Moot Court competition, because this is something uh, as a project extremely interesting. And I think once I have seen a team, but I don't think it was from the RGSL, I may be mistaken, because the final always takes place at the European Court of Justice. Um, and I would like to ask whether you are taking part of what you considered, and if not, then why? Because that would be one thing that I would very much like to attract your uh, attention as a very uh, important project that gives you very good insight of how European law operates with a great perspective of ending up uh, before the Court of Justice of the European Union at the finals. And my second question would be, uh, again, uh, I don't know if you have followed uh, the fact that the European Union institutions on a regular basis offer internships to students. Uh, and especially the Court of Justice also, the Court of Justice of the European Union offers paid internships to students, of course, with the condition that those students speak French, at least on the level B. So my question to you on those two issues, have these issues been, uh, well, are you aware of those possibilities? And if so, then uh, why uh, we see um, so few applications? So what I can say from, from what I have uh, seen and, and listened to is that uh, Yes, we have uh, moot courts. We have moot courts in RGSL. We gather teams each year. Uh, I'm not sure whether specifically European level moot courts, but I know that there are international moot courts to which we gather teams. So we really try to have this kind of practice of, of, of litigation. Uh, on, this is uh, either some civil law arbitration, this also no, commercial law arbitration, uh, also international human rights law and uh, yeah basically many I would say many aspects and regarding the second question uh, yes this is an interesting one I'm not sure of other people but uh, in uh, two episodes ago we asked uh, a similar question to uh, Francesco Luigi Gatta uh, about uh, about these traineeships and internships and yes, we, we identified that this is a very amazing experience, that more people should take this if they want to have an international uh, and a paid experience. But yeah, I, I would su still suggest that there should be more information about this for people so that there are more applications. How about you, Martha? Yeah, definitely. Uh, actually, recently, like two months ago, uh, when we started our... Um, 
first uh, like the semester again. Um, so basically, then the university announced uh, applications for uh, many different uh, mood courts. One of them is Jessup, uh, but it's not it's not European. It's um, not European. And yeah, and uh, the other one was I think about public international law. Uh, I think it was in Georgia, um, but um, in general we have, but I don't think that they are related so much about uh, European human rights and European law. Uh, although one, I think one of the mood course was, but it wasn't uh, that large of, um, um, how to say, it, it was organized, I think, within Latvia. It was a, a national level only. And what concerns the second question, definitely, uh, personally, I have been thinking about applying. I know that the next application time is in January. And uh, I don't know to which particular uh, part uh, of uh, I'm going to apply. I'm thinking about European Parliament or Commission, but uh, we'll see uh, how it goes. I'm, but I'm definitely thinking of applying because it's a wonderful experience. And as uh, Christopher's already mentioned, Francesco offered um, us an insight because he was in uh, two different uh, uh, institutions of EU. And he said that it is a wonderful experience. It's like a traineeship, which you are paid for and if I actually it's like a job uh, for those uh, six months and then you um, understand from the inside how the organization navigates because when you know only theoretically it's not the same and uh, yeah that's basically it I, I I'm definitely thinking of applying no, I think you should you should seriously consider um, the competitions, the mood courts that you mentioned, yes, they are international law, but uh, there is a regular annual uh, European law mood court competition. And for those who are interested in studying more European law, I would say it should be um, an important um, cornerstone, well, an important stone, building stone in, in their studies because uh, you meet teams from other universities, you can see where, uh, which programs you can move, where maybe for PhD or for other studies. And you have, as I, as I say, you have the opportunity to end up before the real judges and advocates general of the Court of Justice of the European Union in the finals. But for the internships, yes, this is also, I highly encourage you to consider that. Uh, every European Union institution offers such an internship. Um, for many institutions, these internships are being paid, you're right, and indeed you are moving for six months uh, to see how that institution works from the inside, and such internships also exist uh, at the Court of Justice, uh, not only at the services, because you have the, legal, the lawyers linguist, the, the research and documentation, but you can also come to uh, stay with uh, uh, the office of the judge and see then how the uh, judgments are being drafted. That's Ms. amazing. Zigarina. I think uh, that's really, the that's the yeah that's the beauty of EU. I think that actually yes. Erasmus is offered, traineeships are offered. So I, I I was on Erasmus. I think it was one of the most beautiful time of my life. And as much as I know that it changed my perspective and uh, how I look at things, and that's why I'm very much motivated to. Um, have this uh, traineeship and to actually compete to get there because I know that it's going to provide me with a totally different viewpoint on things. Yes, it will give you an important insight of how your theoretical knowledge then comes into practical. All right, Ms. Ingeraina. Thank you for your time. I think this is a very insightful experience, uh, experience, not only for us, but also for all the listeners who will who are interested in international uh, law, in being perhaps a judge and applying for a traineeship in the future, perhaps. So yes. really, thank you for your time. And this was very useful, I think. Thank you for inviting me and have the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.